Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Azeroth Daily for the 27th of April 2011. My name is Total Biscuit, bringing you your daily dose of WoW news and comments in the headlines today. A new trailer has been released which previews the 4.2 content, i.e. the Firelands. In fact, there are two of them. One is for the actual raid content, and yes, you will get to see Ragnaros towards the end of it. It's running in the background right now. And there is also one for the daily quest content. They're not exactly chock full of information, but they do give a great perspective on what the dungeons actually look like, which right now is pretty much Molten Core 2, but it does look somewhat better than the old dull dungeons of the past, which is quite nice. So you can check both of those trailers out by clicking the link in the description below this video. They are both part of an article on the Battle.net site, and they're both embedded in there. Latest round of hotfixes has come out, and this is for patch 4.1. They've released a number of fixes, including certain issues that players had with getting stuck retrieving characters or entering instances when the optimized network for speed option is disabled. That has all been sorted out, and there's also a couple of changes to the dungeons and dungeon-related items as well. You can check out the full list in the description below this video. The Battle.net site has published an interview with the one and only Scott Mercer, who is the lead encounter designer, and there is a ton of information here about exactly how the rise of the Zandalari came about, as well as justifications, of course, for the reuse of content, as well as various information about how the characters and loot has been designed. You can go check all of that out in the description below this video, and of course, since it's a blog on the Blizzard page, feel free to go and leave a comment, but don't be too mean, folks. Okay, maybe be a little bit mean. And uh, with that, it's time for your Daily Blues. This is a pretty major change that went undocumented in patch 4.1, and Bashuk is pointing it out right here. What's basically happening is that the reward you get for winning a arena or rated battleground match has been changed to a flat amount regardless of team rating. So it's now been changed to 180 conquest points for winning an arena match and 400 points for winning a rated battleground. That's a massive, massive change as far as I'm concerned, bearing in mind that previous to this, depending on your team rating, the amount of conquest points you got were lower and lower and lower. This is a really interesting change that, in my opinion, is going to have massive, massive consequences. Now, some of it's good. I mean, for instance, I like the fact that arenas and in PvP in general are moving away from the rich get richer poor get poorer setup that it used to have, which is, hey, you've got a high rank and you're winning against lesser teams, well, hey, you get even more conquest points, and so you can get better gear than your opponent and further widen the divide. On the other hand, of course, this could be used to simply deliberately lose a bunch of games in order to go all the way down in your MMR ranking and then go and ruffle stomp a bunch of scrubs in order to get a lot of points, then re rinse and repeat, lose a bunch of games, get back up there, get loads of conquest points, and yeah, I, I see real problems with this. I have to wonder how they're going to balance it. In general, I like the change. Because, as I've said before, I prefer PvP to be about skill and team organization and not about who has the best gear. And this, to me, sort of flattens it out a little bit and makes it easier for players to get the gear regardless of where they are in the league as long as they are winning games. But still, I think this is going to have massive repercussions. I'm looking forward to seeing what the arena and battleground communities come up with in the next few days as to how good a change this actually is. Kelto comes along with the post as regards to undocumented patch changes, claiming our Blizzard being sneaky now, and this is in regards to the conquest points change, as well as this little locket thing you can buy for 5,000 gold that transforms you into a night elf, which is now no longer useful in arena. Well, I'm unsubbing. I really wanted that little locket thing. I actually have no idea what that is. But whatever the case, Bashiok decides to respond by saying, I think there's an unreasonable expectation that we can't make normal human mistakes. Or rather, we make them all the time, except when they're unpopular. And then we must have purposely planned it that way. It's called patch note paranoia. Yes, quite. I suppose things can slip through, considering the size of the development team and the size of the patches. I don't really have a huge problem with undocumented patch changes, as long as they come out and immediately say, oh, sorry, guys, yeah, this was an undocumented patch change, so this is what it is. And the thing is, people find out about it very, very rapidly anyway, and unless it's something that they really should have planned for in advance. I'm saying, like... Let's just say that something was going to happen that would cause a certain item, uh, say a trade mat or something, to become much, much rarer. So if that was in the patch notes, then people would have stockpiled and that would have actually had an effect on the game. However, if it's not in the patch notes, then 
an opportunity could have arisen for people to plan ahead and do something about that, but then can't do it because it wasn't mentioned. I don't know. I suppose there's a flip side to that in that there could be over-preparation and that could actually have a really bad effect on the game economy. If people knew that something was going to become rare, they'd buy it out and then it would result in it actually compounding, I suppose, because it's already rare before the patch launches because everyone's buying it all and then it becomes doubly rare afterwards. Yeah, whatever the case, that's kind of an aside. Yes, they do make mistakes. It is not the worst thing in the world. And in response to yet another dumb reply from the OP, a patch joke turns around and says, well, right, yes, you're right. We specifically did not mention it in the patch notes so I could work late explaining that it was an error and announcing it separately. You have it all figured out. Yeah, quite. Seriously. <laughs> there is no conspiracy. What? Why? Explain why. Why would you do this? Why would Blizzard purposely not put that information in the game. Come on, do you want to give one good reason? No? No, you don't have one, do you? It's just nonsense. There is no smegging conspiracy, for God's sake. And, I might add, he continues on once again. And after somebody claims that this is a bad attitude towards the player base, which I might point out. No, it is not a bad attitude towards the player base. It's like saying a mother has a bad attitude towards a child if she tells him off for doing something wrong. That's absolutely nonsense. And Bashiok throws the hell down after that, which I'm very glad about, and says, I'm here to communicate about the game, not plaster on a smile and say thank you, as Blizzard or myself are verbally abused. Damn freaking right, for God's sake. I remember somebody who did this. He went by the name of Zerek, and then he stopped working as a CM anymore. Please, please, please do not have that happen to Bashiok, because he's probably one of the most honest and forthright guys of the entire team, as far as I can tell. I don't know how he does it. If I were Bashiok, the first thing I would want to do is cull the vast majority of the posters on that forum, because it is a really bad forum. I don't know how he puts up with it, but I guess that's his job. Whatever the case, please keep on trucking, Bashiok. We really need a voice of sanity in that forum, because God knows there's very little else going on in that regard. And it looks like the portals are back in Shatrath and Dalaran, and Bashiok responds by saying exactly why that was, and apparently that's because people were logging in after a long time of not being in the game, and were having a really difficult time finding their way back to where they should be. Well, there's a really easy way to do that. You're aware of this, right? Well, for one, there's the Dark Portal. You walk through the portal, and it takes you to the Blasted Lands. Oh my god, I'm back in Azeroth. Or perhaps, hmm, how do you get off of Northrend? Well, you get on a griffin, and you go to the port, and hey presto, you are suddenly, in fact, back in Azeroth by getting on either the boat, or the Zeppelin, or both, whichever you prefer. Both at the same time, if you like. I couldn't care less, but it's not really that hard to figure out how exactly to get off of it. Seriously, people are so bloody pampered these days. Oh, I can't figure out how to navigate independently. Oh my lord, seriously. Why? Of all things, that is the lamest reason I have ever heard for putting those back in the game. And the thread continues, ladies and gentlemen. Oh yes. And Bashiok really is losing his mind at this point in time. You are a genius. Wow, he also misspelled genius, didn't he? <laughs> he really is going crazy. This is really quite sad, seeing what Bashok is having to put up with. I mean, did you see what he responded to? Have a look at that. Oh, look, the players were right, and Blizzard was in the wrong again. I'm not surprised. I knew this would happen. No, the players are very, very rarely actually right. You are all, let's be honest, a bunch of idiots from time to time. And the guys on the forums are infinitely worse than the people watching this show. Because at least the guys watching this show are actually looking to be informed, as opposed to the guys on the forums who think they know it all. It's about time the player base accepted as a collective that they are capable of being wrong. I admit that I am capable of being wrong when it comes to World of Warcraft stuff. Why is it that nobody on the forum can? You know, they're just looking to grab any small victory that they see, whether or not it actually be part of reality or otherwise, over Blizzard. For God's sake, you're supposed to be working with Blizzard to make a better game, not throwing all of this nonsense out there. Really, really disappointed once again with the forum community. <laughs> Actually, I'm lying. I'm not, because I know exactly, and I do mean exactly, 
what to expect. The exact reason I don't read the bloody things anymore. Now, there is one more response to this particular set of posts, and this one is actually addressing the fact that the reason really doesn't actually hold all that much water for putting those portals back in again. And Bashiot goes, well, specifically for BC, you could have played the entire expansion and still have never purchased a flying mount. And if you timed it right, you could have played all of Wrath and never purchased flying there either. That could be quite a bit of running. Running? The... Have, flight paths? Anyone? You, you have flight paths. You know this. They're in the game. The chances are that you've picked up at least a couple of them. And considering the area that you've logged out in, the chances are you own them there as well. Considering the way that, say, Outland was designed, you probably own all the flight paths anyway, because they lead you from zone to zone that way. So I'm really not buying that particular explanation at all. And that's not to say that I've suddenly turned on Bashiok. I think he is being the mouthpiece for Blizzard's decision. And I don't even know if he fully believes this himself, but I don't think he deserves all the abuse he's getting. That's absolute nonsense. And with that, it's time for your daily grind. Right, we're going to finish off the Stalin quest line with the finale of it, which involves using a ring to summon the revenant of Stalvin Mist Mantle. And he is then confronted by Tobias, who demands to know whether or not all of this information about him dying a murderer and massacring a family is actually true. As it turns out, it is. And Tobias is overcome with rage, attacks and kills his brother, who then tells him, well, I wasn't so different from you. And as a result of that, of course, Tobias runs away and kind of regrets ever getting involved in this whole sordid business. It would have been better simply to be left ignorant by the sounds of it. So there you go, folks. A murder mystery for you, which has a fairly sad ending to it. But once again, a great example of cataclysm storytelling going above and beyond what has come in the previous expansions. And with that, it's time for your weekly feature. This is the Court of Law. Now, we continue our series on capital cities of Azeroth by having a look at the Undercity. I guess what a lot of you don't know is the fact that the Undercity was actually named many years before the Forsaken claimed it as their own. Far beneath the Palace of Lordaeron, the Undercity held the ancient crypts and catacombs of Lordaeron's royalty, as well as the city dungeons and sewers. Lordaeron was settled by the disenfranchised Lords of Strom, capital of the nation of Arathor, who were part of a group that left Strom because they desired the verdant lands to the north, the capital city served as a spiritual destination for the citizens of seven human kingdoms. Following the opening of the Dark Portal, the nations of Azeroth and Kazmadan were conquered by the Horde. The refugees from Azeroth, led by Lord Anduin Lothar, fled across the sea to Lordaeron. There, Lothar convinced the leaders of the human nations, as well as the dwarves of Ironforge, gnomes of Gnomrigan, and high elves of Quel'Thalas, to join forces in the alliance of Lordaeron. Under the leadership of King Terranus Menethil II and Lord Lothar, the Alliance was victorious, pushing the Horde back to the Dark Portal and destroying the gateway to the Orcs' homeworld. Lothar fell in the assault on Blackrock Spire, and with the loss of his political skill, rifts developed between the Alliance nations. The main issue of dispute was a tax levied by King Terranus to finance the internment of the Orcs. Though Lordaeron attempted to retain its central role, several nations pulled their support from the Alliance. Following years of debate over the internment of the Orcs, a plague appeared in the north of Lordaeron. As it spread throughout the towns and cities of Lordaeron, one after another fell to the scourge. Finally, with the corruption of the heir to the throne of Lordaeron, Prince Arthas Menethil, the capital city itself succumbed. Thus, in an ironic twist of fate, it was Lordaeron that lay in ruins, with refugees streaming to Kazmadan and Azeroth. During the Third War, the once glorious capital of Lordaeron was decimated by a scourge army under the command of Prince Arthas Menethil. Death offered no escape for the scores of humans killed during the Lich King's campaign to scour the living from Lordaeron. Instead, the kingdom's fallen were risen into undeath as scourge minions and forced to wage an unholy war against everything and everyone that they once held dear. In the wake of Illidan's failed attempt to melt the icy continent of Northrend, the powerful energies possessed by the Lich King inside his frozen throne slowly began to decay. Inexorably, this resulted in a partial loss of control of the more distant Scourge forces. The result was that many undead, under the Lich King's mental domination, had their conscious will restored. Their spirits and memories were somehow returned to their undead bodies. Even the Lich King's champion, Arthas, began to weaken as the Lich King's power waned. Arthas was suddenly thrust into an undead civil war. Still fanatically loyal to the Lich King, Arthas heeded the call of his master and returned to Northrend as Illidan launched his second attempt to destroy the Lich King directly. Arthas left the Lich Kel'Thuzad in command of his forces when he departed. 
With Arthur's departure from Lordaeron, the three dreadlords, Balnazar, Varamathras, and Detherok, attempted to gain control of the undead forces in Lordaeron, using their formidable mental powers. The former High Elf Sylvanas Windrunner rallied many of the newly freed undead to counter the dreadlord's efforts. Sylvanas was amazingly successful and not only crushed the Dreadlord's forces, but also utterly destroyed the last major contingent of human forces in Lordaeron. She forced Varamathras into her service in exchange for sparing his life and took control of the ruined capital of Lordaeron as her own. Within the sewer system of the ruined city, Arthas had constructed his throne room, but with Arthas now gone, Sylvanas claimed this undercity as her capital and set out to expand her ranks by freeing even more undead. While the forces of the Horde and the Alliance were concentrated on a joint effort at Angrathar the Wrathgate, an uprising broke out within the Undercity. Demons of the Burning Legion and Forsaken Rebels led by the Dreadlord Varamathras and Grand Apothecary Putris managed to gain control of the Undercity, killing several Forsaken and nearly killing the Dark Lady as well. In response, the Horde, led by Sylvanas Windrunner and Warchief Thrall, attacked from the front entrance to reclaim the city while the Alliance, led by Varian and Jaina, attacked from sewers to restore Lordaeron to the Alliance. The ensuing battle ultimately killed both Varamathras and Putris, along with their fellow demons and forsaken rebels. However, being no stranger to broken dreams, it is only fitting that Lordaeron bore witness to the end of the Horde and Alliance Treaty, as King Varian declared war upon the Horde after seeing the status of the once-proud city. Jaina subsequently teleported the Alliance back to Stormwind. The Undercity remains largely unscathed in the wake of the Cataclysm, but with the assault on Gilneas and the rumours of a new plague being deployed by the Forsaken Apothecaries, some wonder what plans Sylvanas and the Forsaken have for the future. Now, I know I said I wanted to do a double feature today, but we're still having a ton of problems with filming and getting everything sorted out, so that's going to have to wait. I will try and get the Achievement Hog done at some point this week. So with that, it's time for the Mailbox. This one comes in from Bailey, who says, Hello, the reason for this email is for the issue that I seem to be coming across when I'm leveling up an alt or just making a new caster for fun. I like getting my ults to around level 15 to 20 before I start doing dungeons using the dungeon finder, and I always choose which dungeons have the best gear for me with a certain add-on I use. But I always seem to get into a group where if the tank is a warrior, he's more than likely few respect, or if it's a paladin, then they are almost always retribution. Now I have a few 85s, mainly a death knight, a warlock, and a paladin. My paladin is a tank, and I how to do my job and I rarely get yelled at unless I'm with some random pug that doesn't understand the dungeon. But back to my point, these Fury tanks almost always seem to be the ult of an 85 that thinks he's pro for using the wrong spec for tanking and they always seem to be in full heirloom gear. Now I have no issue with heirlooms if they're used right and you aren't just grabbing them for the sake of having a 5% XP boost at the cost of wearing cloth when you should have plate or at least mail. I've met people that will wear gear that doesn't match their class, and whenever I bring the issue up, I always seem to get kicked. I know it's an obvious issue, but I'd rather not be in a group with the tank using an heirloom broadsword and some crappy leather chest piece, and I had the thought, why not just make these heirloom pieces only able to be used by people who have the specs that actually match? Long email, I know, but my major question is, am I being too much of a high standards prick expecting someone to use the right spec and gear for an alt, or should I suck it up and wade through these fail pugs? Well, it's not being a prick to expect people to use a tanking spec for tanking. That makes perfect sense. I think the problem that I see right now is that people pick Fury specs or whatever for leveling because you don't want to level as a tank. Now, it's been a while since I've played any kind of plate-wearing class, even at the low levels, but what I would say is that most people want to level as a spec that actually does real damage, as opposed to a tanking spec, and that kind of makes sense unless you're intending to do nothing but dungeons for your levels, which is viable, but that's also very much a minority view. Not a lot of people actually do it. So I can kind of understand why someone would want to level as Fury as opposed to another spec, I have to wonder whether or not it seems like a good idea to introduce dual spec at a much, much earlier level, specifically because of that fact. And I know that a lot of the lower level dungeons are a bit easier, but still, as you said, you've got people wandering around in heirloom cloth pieces because, hey, that was what their last alt had and they're getting it for the experience boost or whatever. I think the heirloom system in general is just kind of flawed that way. And because you are expected to buy multiple pieces of heirloom gear for your different alts, then they're not really heirlooms, are they? That's the weird thing about it. Unless you decide to uh, create multiple classes of the same kind of type, say cloth casters, for instance, you can probably get away with it there, but you certainly can't get away with it if you decide, well, I'm going to take a rogue and then I'm going to make a paladin. You need completely different heirloom gear, so it's not actually passed down from character to character. 
I have to wonder if it's a good idea to be able to exchange heirloom gear, for instance. I don't know what you'd need to do that, but instead of having to buy yet more, considering this stuff is kind of expensive, I mean, you do need an awful lot of points in order to actually get heirloom gear. I wonder if it's worth having some kind of exchange program for heirloom gear that doesn't actually make any sense on alts of a different type. Just something to bear in mind. But I don't think you're elitist for wanting people to actually spec properly and wear the proper gear for tanking, because, hey, nobody wants their time wasted. This one comes in from Anonymous and says, I'll try and keep it short and its storyline to a bare minimum. I had my friend visiting the other day to play a few video games and take a mental break from finals week. During his visit, we decided to hop on WoW and run a battleground or dungeon. And while we were sitting around at our character screens, about to log in, my friend looked at me and told me that he would like to run some of the older content on a low-level alt of his. I quickly looked over my characters and noticed that I didn't have a tune within 10 levels of his character. I always get tired of trying to find a character that's level appropriate to play with friends, and I don't have the time to keep up with the current level cap. This is when I had an idea. Say you have a friend with a level 42, and all you have is a level 85. You could group up and queue for any level appropriate dungeon for your friend, and when you got there, you would be ported to the dungeon, but you as the 85 would have your level pulled down to match the instance to be able to have fun and not just walk through. You would only be able to lower your level and use something like the current in-game leveling gear on your tune during the instance. I know it's a rough draft of an idea, but what are your thoughts? Well, to be fair, there's a lot of MMOs that have already done something similar. For instance, City of Heroes had something called the Sidekick System, which allowed you to down-rank yourself to the level of some guy you were trying to help out. I am very surprised that it's not in the game already. Considering Blizzard's propensity for taking ideas from other games, and there is absolutely nothing wrong with that, I might add, it seems really weird considering also the fact that they like to say, oh, well, it's all about playing with friends and making friends and helping your friends and being part of a community, that they wouldn't put in tools which allow you to do just that. I think that Blizzard has a real problem when it comes to creating systems that take away artificial blocks from playing with your friends. For instance, the fact that you have to pay for realm transfers or faction transfers. It's not really okay to say, oh, well, we really want you to play with your friends and be part of a real community and keep you playing when you then put so many artificial barriers in the way and that's one and of course you've then got the level gap thing which is quite another in terms of a barrier to playing with your friends in a way that's actually enjoyable i think blizzard does need to look into that and i think a side kicking system would be ideal okay folks wow i've really overrun on that one that's 22 minutes thanks bash yok and the guys over at the forums for giving us a reason to rant well i suppose that's making up for the fact that last week we barely had any blue posts well, thanks for that. Much appreciated. Okay, folks, I'm done for the day. Thank you very much for watching. As always, please remember to thumb it up and favorite it if you happen to like it. That it really does help, you know, more than you know. It's very flattering, and, of course, it really helps the channel out. So you don't have to, but it really, really is appreciated. My name's been Total Biscuit, and I will see you next time.